clearly stated. But, so this is a very simple situation. Uh, all these sigma z's are conserved. The eigenstates are just spins a line up or down. Four eigenstates, they lose entanglement. Well, physically, what happens here for a general state is that spin one recesses about the z-axis at a rate given by the sigma z of spin two because of this term with the field on spin one. And same thing over here, spin two is processing at a rate given by the sigma z of spin one. So in this model, you have no transport of the conserved total as z, nor of energy. Because there's no transfer of energy between any of these terms under the dynamics. Um, but yet, they become entangled. That's just a simple point. And uh, so we had uh, <coughs> obtained the result that the eigenstates in the mini-body localized phase have area law entanglement. Um, and I think I, certainly I sort of concluded from that that the mini-body localized phase doesn't get entangled. Um, and then there was this paper, you know, we just really hadn't thought about it carefully. There was this paper by uh, Barterson et al. From Bill Moore's group uh, a year, a year and a half ago, or something, um, and they did some matrix product dynamics on many-body localized models, like the one I'm telling you about, and they saw the entanglement spreading, um, and they were raising the question: Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not really localized because the entanglement is getting entangled, right? But the point is, uh, which 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 has been realized since then. Uh, uh, that that entanglement in the localized phase, you do have spread of entanglement, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. Um, but you don't you don't you don't need transport of anything to uh, get the to, to have the entanglement spread. Okay, so. Uh, so we'll go next to uh, what we what I call uh, phenomenology of the MDL phase, anybody localized phase, um, and this is this is something that's been a, uh, a set of papers. So first, Sylvian uh, Popich. And there's Bauer from Station Q, Bauer and Nyack. And then there was one from Swingle. And this is all things posted in just the past few months. So, so I'm going to talk about it, say, in terms of a spin model, but I think this is more general. So let's say our Hamiltonian is, uh, so say, we'll say we're, this is phenomenology of the many-body localized phase when all many-body eigenstates are local. Now, there's also a regime when at high, temp high temperatures, the states are thermal, but you go down in temperature and you hit a localization transition, and states below a given temperature or energies below a given temperature are localized. And that's actually the regime that was discussed by uh, Bosco and Lehner Altschuler. And in that regime, there's actually, we really don't have a corresponding phenomenology. That, that works. So, so there's actually uh, you know, something there that needs to be done is to figure out what we can, you know, to do something analogous to what I'm about to do right now that would apply more generally. Right? So it's not a phenomenology of all 
cases of many body localized is just in the case when all the eigenstates are local in the entire spectrum. Uh, okay, so we have so we have n spins, some field, some there's the spin operator, and then plus let's say two spin interactions. short-range two-spin interactions. Um, and these spins here, which are sort of the bare variables in which, you know, which are low in some positions in real space, uh, we call these the p-mits, p for physical. So those are the bare spins. Right? Um, and in the many body localized phase, so the many body localized phase, when all eigenstates are localized, um, its integrals, so it's in a certain sense an uh, integrable system, its integrals of motion are basically dressed versions of these guys, right? If the interactions are not present, then the components of these spins parallel to these fields are uh, the constants of motion, which commute with the Hamiltonian, and they commute with each other. Um, but with the interactions, basically, all we have to do is dress these guys to maintain those commutation relations. And we call the integrals of motion, uh, right, they are pseudo spins. Uh, and I call them tau. And they're, they're, it's just the z component. Just like here, the only component of this spin which is conserved is the component of the spin parallel to this field, right? So tau z i. So we have a set of tau z i, i equals 1 to n. And we have the Hamiltonian, and all these operators mutually commute. Right? So that's that's the picture, and the tau, and, and then you have raising and lowering operators for these you know, tau z to so so the taus. Uh, we call the l bits l for localized. Um, and then you take, if you write the taus in terms of the sigmas, uh, in the many body localized phase, if I write tau i, expand it in terms of the b bits, what it'll look like is some sum over it, size j. Ki j sum matrix here, sigma j plus sum over k l i j k sigma j sigma k third rank tensor here dot dot dot. So in actually, let me let me call this. MBL phase when all my, many body eigenstates are localized, let me call that FMBL for fully, <laughs> fully many body localized. So in the FMBL phase, these K and L are short range. <coughs> the p-bits dressed with two-spin operators, three-spin operators, etc., but only locally. Okay. Um, and the way Bauer and Nyack say it is, right, so we have 
one basis, which are which is the product states of these guys. Right? That's a natural basis to work with, their basis. Or you could look at the basis of the eigenstates of the constant the integrals of motion. And to go from one base to, basis to the other, of course, that's just a unitary rotation in the many body space. Um, and as Bauer and Nyack emphasize, they say that must be a local unitary, which is what, really what I'm saying here, going from the sigmas to the taus. Now, of course, these k's and l's have to be some property so that you know, this thing has the commutation relations of a Pauli matrix. Right? So there's all sorts of constraints here. Um, but going from the sigmas to the taus is just a unitary operation. Um, and, and we're insisting it's short range in real space. So such a mapping exists in the many-body localized phase. If you try to find such a mapping in the ETH phase, uh, it, you, don't, you can't find one where this series converges. Right? Of course, if you use operators here going out to the non-local operators that are you know, global, right? if, I'm, if I allow myself to make my pseudo spin out of arbitrarily long products, outer products of sigmas with the order n terms, then I can do it. Um, but in the in the local, it's only in the localized phase that I can do it with, uh, with something that's local. Okay. So this is because this model is integral, but <coughs> there are these constants of motion, and you're now stipulating that in the, in the fully fully localized phase, um, rather than having these completely non-local operators which can which, which constitute your constants of motion, you actually can restrict yourself. Is that the idea? Well, the statement that the model in the many-body localized phase is integrable, you know, that's a non-trivial statement. Yeah, but right? the model it appears to be true if and the integrals of motion, if this model here is not in any sense explicitly integral or integrable in any parent there way. Any special choice of agents. Yeah, right. Of course, I can certain one-dimensional models with certain two-spin interactions. I can make them right. But what I want to have is I want to have these guys be random, and this is in the fully many-body localized phase. Right? And it's not what would normally be called an integral model. Right? It's not integral by any of the normal ways you solve many-body problems. Right? But I'm saying the many-body localized phase appears to have the structure that it actually is an integral model. And the constants of motion are local objects. Um, and they can be constructed you know, by something like this. Right? So this is this is an assertion. Okay. It's a phenomenology. Okay, so it's not it's not at all obvious why at the moment why we have the <laughs> number of 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 cows of I mean of um cows which can be good simultaneously. Uh, well, there's an N of them, right? So this I it's the same number as there were spins. So <coughs> I equals one to N. Right? That's as many as you can have, right? Because the Hilbert space <coughs> Right. This Hilbert space has to have the same size as this one. Right? So, there's, so there's n of them here. Okay. Right? And you know, basically, if the interactions are weak, these taus are, to first approximation, the components of sigma parallel to this edge. Because right? we know when the interactions are not present, that's exactly what they are. Yeah. And then the inter when we add the interactions, then we have to start dressing them. Right? And so these, these KIJs will start having things off-site and you'll start having these terms, etc. But it's also possible that once you add small interactions, they just disappear completely and they just aren't you know, integral to motion anymore. That's conceivable. I guess, yeah. Yes. No, no, this is not a demonstration. There's no demonstration that this happens. Okay. Right? Although, you know, there's, an arg you know, there's, there's arguments, like, like they give a nice argument that basically something like this has to, has to happen although they don't do it on the level of 
right? So, so Cerebin and company, they have a thing where instead of looking at spins, they look at blocks. And they look at blocks that are bigger than the localization length. And they, they make a, an argument from that that it has to have this kind of structure, but on a bigger scale. We, we ask it to happen on the scale of a single spin, and I, I think it's harder to make that argument so it's more just a, an assertion that, that this is a, that's why, I, that's why I call it a phenomenology, right? Yeah. Other than the graphs of motion, the uh, constants uh, over some exponential time, ex so because we know that the model is not integrable, so they are not true integral of motions, so they are approximate integrals of motions. No, which are no, I'm talking about exact integrals of motion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Question? Yeah. Uh, two questions. So you, um, you're saying from experience you find that there are uh, there are integrals of motion in disordered spin systems that you've studied, which uh, have an exact number of uh, have integrals of motion which are the same uh, in number as the number of spins in the model. Okay, so let me back up and tell and motivate this better. Because okay. I think clearly people are uncomfortable with it as just an assertion. Okay, so there's a, there's a, and, and, and I'll tell you where, well, you know, I sort of had this picture in the back of my mind for a long time, but there was this, this paper uh, by Kofsky a year or so ago, uh, where it's, it's sort of, the paper looks like it's on a totally different topic, but he makes, he makes an interesting point. Okay, so this, this model has 2 to the n eigenstates. Okay. It's 2 to the n eigenstates, right? And now, I can also have a, a chain of spins with tau z's and assume the Hamiltonian of that model uh, has uh, all the tau z's commute and also with the Hamiltonian. So I just have a set of bits. So, so, so this thing here, if I have this situation here, I know what the eigenstates are. Right? The eigenstates are just spins up or down. Right? So here this has this situation without even specifying the Hamiltonian. If these guys all commute, if we know they all mutually commute, we know what the 2 to the n eigenstates are. They're just strings of, just binary strings. Okay? So we have 2 to the n eigenstates here. Okay? So this, this is assuming all these things mutually commute. Okay? And so what we can do is we can just say, let's just make a one to one mapping between these states and these states. And let's consider all such mappings. So there are 2 to the n factorial such mappings. Okay. Just one to one. But the energies won't match. No, just the states. Okay. Just the states. And so once I've done that, then I can just read off what these operators are. And let me, let me actually show you how to do that a little bit. So, uh, so let's say state alpha is a particular uh, state of these guys. Okay? So some sequence of spins. So it has a set of uh, tau z nice. And let's say tau xi alpha Let's call that alpha bar. And what that means is I've flipped only spin i and left all the other spins the same. Okay? And so now tau z i is just, and so, so for each, so let's consider all eigenstates alpha with tau z i up. 
And for every alpha, there is an alpha bar with tau z i down, and all the other spins the same. Okay, so now I'm going to sum over all those alphas, of which there are 2 to the n minus 1, okay? all states of all the other spins, but spin up. And then I write tau z i is, is alpha, alpha minus alpha bar. This just measures this. The spin is up if it's in one of these, and it's down in one of these. Okay, so that's tau zi, and I can make tau xi by uh, sum over alpha, alpha bar plus alpha bar alpha. And that flips, flips, flips the spin no matter what the state is. So, so anytime I have such a mapping, I can explicitly construct these operators in terms of these eigenstates. Right? So every model is integrable by this definition. Exactly integrable. Because I'm building operators, n operators, conscious of emotion, out of the exact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. But it's only 2 to the power of n eigenstates, but n integrals of motion, so the system Right. It's not fully integrable. It's, uh, integrable. No, no. Integral models usually only they have n, n integrals of motion. That's normal. n degrees of freedom, n integrals of motion. But you have two to the power of n eigenstates. Or yeah. So I'm using the two to the n eigen. But I'm using the two to the n eigenstates to make n integrals integrals of motion. But then you don't tell us that this two to the power of, of n degrees of freedom. You still think that you have n degrees of freedom. Because I saw that if I, yeah, I have, have n degree, I have n spins here, and yes. I have n l bits in this this description as well. So I have n, no, degree, no, no, no. n degrees of freedom, and I have two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. Yeah, but I saw that for quantum system uh, to determine integrability, we should look at full Hilbert space and not only at the number of uh, spins which you have in the system. Well, okay. So for today's purposes, let's say a system is integrable if you if it has n degrees of freedom and you have n integrals of motion. Let's just no. use that as well, today's definition of integrability. You, you don't have to. It's like you have a two n n uh, twofold degrees of freedom. So if, for each one, you specify whether it's up or down. You specify the system, right? Those are the integrals of motion. Right? Can I think about it like that? If you consider any tau z, tau z i, i runs from 1 to n. These are constants of motion because they all commute with each other and they commute with the Hamiltonian. Oh, I didn't So that's enough. If you take your favorite integrable model, Ising model, APLT chain, it only has n integrals of motion. It doesn't have 2 to the n. No, well, you can always make it's more. Possible to construct all right, I can make more, right? Of course, I can take any product of these taus. Right. OK, so I have 2 to the n, because I not only have these guys, but I have products okay, of all pairs, all threes, all fours, mm -hmm. all fives. So I have okay. 2 to the n. Okay. I have 2 to the n. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, so there are 2 to the n. But, but I'm just going to focus on these n, because the other ones just simply yeah, fall. Right. So, you, so, so, so what his point is interesting, if you have no prejudice about what basis you can use, and what operators you can talk about, every model, although there is this peculiar thing that the Hilbert space has to be factorizable, <laughs> right? So if the Hilbert space is a prime number, you can't do it, <laughs> right? You can always project onto the eigenspace, and then those projection operators are in evolution, and so I mean, this is... But can, you, right? you, know, can you make this structure here? Um, Maybe not, but you're, I mean, yeah, definitely. No, I'm talking about the structure of a bunch of pseudo spins or a bunch of local, local type operators that all commute with each other. And, and it, it, it seems, uh, you know, of course, you can always just get, but let, let's, let's leave that aside. Um, the point is, it's a rubbish, it's a useless definition of integrability, uh, except in many body localized phase where it happens that uh, well, it's, these yeah. operators it's, are kind of local. It's only a useful definition of integrability if the operators you produce 
are things which are physically reasonable. Yeah, right. <laughs> which is, that's also the case in uh, traditional interval models. Right? But it's physically reasonable means that expansion is short, uh, kind of short range. Right? right. And so the assertion is that in the fully many body localized phase, when you search through all of these <coughs> 2 to the n factorial possible mappings, you will find some where this expansion, where you do this structure, this here, and you find this expansion, and you find that it's short range, right? And ideally, you, you would find the mapping which makes this, in some sense, as short range as possible. The short right? range in the sense of the... <coughs> that uh, these guys fall off with distance. You mean IJ distance or the... IJ distance. Similar? Distances, right, IJ and K are in real space, so... so all of these kernels, as you move the indices apart in real space, the, 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 uh, the average value of this guy falls off exponentially, and also the probability of it being large falls off exponentially. But, but what about uh, falling off in the sense of... And all, yeah, they fall off, power. they get weaker as you go down the series as well. Yeah. But, but is that a, the higher order ones fall off as well. Yeah. Is that a quality of the no, well, that's the structure. No, I'm saying, I believe that that's the structure the localized phase has. But, you know, it hasn't been, this is all very new. It hasn't really been explored uh, super uh, carefully. Mm -hmm. OK. And so if it has this structure, Let's take our Hamiltonian and write it in terms of the L bits. What's it going to look like? Okay. So H, so in terms of L bits, our Hamiltonian, okay. it commutes with all the tau Z's. So that means it doesn't contain any tau x's or tau y's. But it can contain products of tau z's. Any product of tau z is fine. Right? And so it's going to have i equals 1 to n. hi twiddle tau z i plus some i j j i j twiddle tau z i j plus higher order terms up to arbitrary high orders. But again, we expect in the localized phase that this series converges. The terms fall off uh, as you go in order. And the terms fall off exponentially with distance when you move the indices apart in the multi-spin terms. But even if your interactions here in the bare Hamiltonian are strictly just nearest neighbors, say, we expect that when you dress those things and get the integrals of motion, this series here, although it converges, it doesn't stop. You know, it's got weak terms out to arbitrary order and arbitrarily large distances. It's just they fall off exponentially. And so that means even when i and j are far apart, these tau z's actually have a little bit of weight in the real physical space in terms of the sigmas on nearest neighbor sites. And so interactions do get generated to arbitrary distance in terms of the taus, uh, even if they were strictly cut off in real space in terms of the sigmas. So this is this is uh, the phenomenological Hamiltonian of the many-body localized phase. It's got some local variables. Now, of course, you know, they might not be two-state objects, right? There might be types of many-body localized phase where this would be more than a two-state object, and that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, but there should be a bunch of commuting variables, local ones, and then interactions between but, but the interactions commuting, you know, all these terms commuting, but interactions falling you know, at, at any distance, but falling off exponentially with the distance. So particularly, let me just 
put that here. J i j took twiddle falls off as e to the minus r i j over the localization. Here it would be if you asked how these fall off with distance. Well, first of all, you pick the best, the best mapping local. in the sense of the one that gives the shortest localization length. And the localization length would be a measure of how these guys fall off with distance. So they will, you know, the average value, you know, there's some ad hoc in the definition, but say the average value of this will fall off exponentially, and this, and this. And I would expect they all fall off at the same length scale. Or, or you, you, know, you might say the probability of this being large falls off exponentially with the distance. But you presumably would pick this mapping, the one that gives, you would pick a definition of the localization length, and you would pick the mapping that minimizes it. Because, of course, you can make it larger by picking a, a less optimal map. So then, operation-wise, it's really hard to determine. Yeah, right. That's a big number. <laughs> right, no, no. We thought about doing this num numerically and testing it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> And you're, at this point, keeping the option open that the Tosi need not have two Values, but it would be multiple values. More yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, well not, presumably not if you start with a spin model, right? But of course, the, you know, the bare model itself might have degrees of freedom that are that don't come in powers of two, right? If if, if you have a four-state thing, you can always just describe it as two two-state things. Right? So it would be only if the original Hamiltonian had degrees of freedom which had states that weren't in powers of two. Right, and then you would have to use things different than powers of two to do this. I see. So for spins, you're keeping, you're restricting yeah. yourself. To, to like if this was a, if I put a spin one here with three states, then I have three to the n states, right? And obviously this construction has to be done with things with threes, mm -hmm. right? Because you need only one way to factor three to the n. Mm -hmm. um, that's why. You, basically, you, you look at the size of it. You take the full Hilbert space. And you factorize it, you know, and that those factors are the are the number of states each each L bit has to have. Okay, so if you believe this, then in terms of these tau's, the eigenstates of the many-body Hamiltonian in the, in this phase are just simple bit strings, so they are, they're just the the, they're not entangled in this basis, right? um, and that tells you uh, tells you how, and tells you how to make a permanent qubit. Okay, so let's take eigenstate n, which is some some pattern like you know, up up one across down two blah blah. blah. N in terms, so this is in terms of this is now in terms of the tau z's. Right? So that's what the eigenstates look like in terms of the tau z's, right? And then I make uh, n bar, which is uh, tau x i n, just like I did here with the alpha. Right? So I flip spin i. Right? And then I make the state psi equals alpha n plus beta n bar. And what I've done is I've written a qubit on L bit i, which is localized with some waveform near a particular position in real space. Um, 
and this qubit lives forever. It doesn't need cohere. And what does that look like? Of course, that just looks like this state here, and then just with cross alpha up i plus beta down i parentheses cross. Okay, so all the, all the other bits are either up or down, and then only bit i is in a non-trivial is is outside of the eigenstate of tau z. a permanent qubit, and it's fine. But then as soon as I try to write two of them, I've got this situation here. I write one on here, I write one on here, and here's the interaction right here between those two qubits, right? And if they're within a finite distance, this j is some number, it's not zero falls off exponentially with the distance, but those two qubits will get entangled. Right? So that's the sense in which entanglement does spread in the many-body localized phase. Right? If you start with a product state of all these guys, no entanglement, it'll get entangled due to these multi-spin terms here. Without propagating any, any uh, energy or well, the general energy is the only conserved thing here. So because of this, I and J entangle on time uh, scale J I J with O to the minus one. Right, so they have an interaction which is very weak. It's you know the in order for the Right, you know, I is processing at a rate that depends on. Actually, let me let me just say something right here first, uh, which I, I forgot to mention. So in this state here, I put this qubit on spin I. It's processing. Right, it's processing because you know, there's a field on spin I, spin I as well as these other terms. So this guy processes at a rate set by all other tau z j's that are within a finite distance. So every other tau z j within a finite distance of this particular L bit through these interaction terms influences how fast it processes. So this is a permanent qubit that is processing at a rate which is different for different initial eigenstates that I use to build it on. So I've taken an eigenstate, I've written a qubit on it, it's an eigenstate everywhere else, um, and it will process, but it processes at a rate which is not universal, it depends on you know, what I've chosen there. Right? And because of that, if I'm not in an eigenstate everywhere else, I get this entanglement. So these two guys, because the, the rate at which process, spin i processes depends on whether j is up or down by an amount proportional to j, the phase difference will build up as j times t, just due to this difference in precession, and j times t becomes of order 1 when at a, on a time scale j inverse to the minus 1, which goes as e to the plus rij over sigma, so cover c. Right? And so that tells you the entanglement spreads to distance r going as c log time. So the, the entanglement spreads uh, in proportion to log time in the many body localized phase. So what happens in the many body localized phase, you have some initial state, you might put your spins in some, some initial state. Um, the information about locally what tau z was 
stays put. And if you look again in this vicinity, you can read off what tau z was, because tau z doesn't go anywhere. It commutes with the Hamiltonian. It doesn't change. So that information about the initial state is preserved locally. doesn't spread through the whole system. So the system doesn't thermalize. But the information about what tau x and tau y were, in general, gets spread around, entangled with all the other tau z's. And you can't just simply read it off over there. Now, you might be able to bring it back with a spin echo, and disentangle it, because the thing that's <coughs> dephasing ta the taus is a static bath of all the other tau z's. And that's the situation where spin echo works. So if you can do a spin echo, you could recover the information that was initially there, or at least some. What, what do you mean by what tau x and tau y were in the you have some initial condition with the, with the you know, tau x and tau y having some expectation value in some okay, direction. Some expectation value. Yeah, so, so tau, tau vector on site i has some expectation value, which is some local property of the initial condition. And the z component will not change. So you can just go in later, much later, look at the local probabilities and read it off. But the x and y information will get scrambled due to this due to this deface. It's like the problem you saw, right? Just for yeah, yeah. That's that's why I was talking about this, right? Because it's just this simple story here. So just because the eigenstates have no entanglement doesn't mean the dynamics doesn't generate entanglement. In general, the dynamics will generate entanglement, even if the eigenstates are Protestants. Um, you know, and that was it's sort of an obvious point once you realize it. But it's, it's one that this, at that time, small community of people working on many-body localization missed until uh, they kind of rubbed their noses in it with some numerical data. They didn't appreciate it either. They thought, oh, this, this means it's not really localized. That's, a, that's the conclusion, or at least they said. Suggest, oh, maybe this means it's not really localized when they saw the entanglement spread. Because, again, naively you think, oh, it should, should, shouldn't get entangled. But it should get entangled. And, and now we understand that. But much slower than. Yeah, much slower, right? Entanglement normally spreads ballistically at the Lee Robinson velocity. So here it's spreading just logarithmically time. Yeah. Uh, can I reformulate the transition between localized and ergodic as uh, in terms of how quickly those kernels decay with length? Those Kij and... Yeah, I think so. so if you're working at maximum entry, infinite temperature. Right? Because this that's the transition between... So that's the transition between ETH at infinite temperature and fully many body localized. Now, if you're talking about the transition <coughs> not at maximum entropy, uh, right, so this thing, because it's, it's about the entire spectrum, this picture fails as soon as any of the states stop being localized. So what you, what you get from this construction, the, the localization length you get, is the largest localization length over the entire spectrum, which we expect normally is at the maximum of the density of states, at the, the maximum entropy states, or, or what can correspond to infinite temperature. Right? So, so, so it's not, you know, but there, you know, there, we believe there's, you know, as Bosco and Ross were saying, we believe there's a transition not just at infinite temperature, but at finite temperature, and this doesn't really get it, right? And so that's what's missing. Is how do we how do we do something like this when we're not talking about all states and we want to focus on some lower entropy set of states that correspond to some lower temperature and that's not clear how to do that so that's a, a challenge. Yeah. Just making sure. So here you start with all your initial state basically has all the tau z 
in a fixed direction. This guy. Except for, yeah. This guy. Yeah. yeah, except for the I, um, I, where you start in a... A linear superposition. Or, yeah. Okay. Right, so I've written some, I've written one qubit of quantum information on one of these L bits, but left the other ones in eigenstates of tau C. And that's a, that'll live forever. That information will never go anywhere. You can always just go back and read it off here. Assuming you know the Hamiltonian and how fast things are processing so you know, know how to rotate it back. But it doesn't get entangled. It stays a product state. It doesn't, doesn't decohere. It just processes at a rate that we, might be hard to know. <laughs> Well, no, as soon, as soon as I've flipped more than one of them, they will get entangled with each other. They do, but the local information of the C, you can start... Of tau Z, yeah, tau Z stays put. The information about tau Z, but that's not a qubit. That's just a classical bit, right? The qubit, you got to know all the components. Or not, maybe not. It's, maybe it's not a classical bit because it, you know, it could have an inter. You know, it's it's a it's a real number. It's not a it's not a qubit. Okay, so now I'm going to go to for those of you who didn't study Rahul's poster on Tuesday night or whatever. I'm going to say a little bit about that. Order. This is, uh, we have a paper, which is so that will be for sure. Vadim Oganesia and Arjit Paul, Shivaji Sandhi. And that's now what's on the archive, and it's also now in Fizzer B. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do one example just to give you a flavor of this. Um, so let's consider uh, the transverse fieldizing model, which you've seen a few times. Okay, so the idea here is this is this this is about combining. Combine MBL, uh, which is and uh, more conventional phase transitions. So phase transitions of the not localization phase transitions, but like symmetry breaking phase transitions and topological ordering. Right? So that's when you put these two together. What do you? What kinds of things can you get? And we have some examples. Okay, so I'm going to do a transverse field Ising model. The simple, what's the simplest kind of phase transition? It's an Ising model, right? Ising ordering. So, so we'll do the simplest case here. Um, and let's just just for concreteness, let's say we're doing this in 2D, and it's a random transverse field Ising model, like uh, I think you've heard about from uh, Thomas Boita and from Gill. Um, and let's let's actually make it a ferromagnet. Okay, so it's going to be uh, minus some i equals one. Let me just say l squared. So it's l by l lattice, just to be concrete. Um, uh, we're going to put a transverse field on. So h i sigma x i. Transverse field could be random. Say they're all the same. Say they're all positive. Just, just again, keep things simple, but they might have random magnitude. Um, and then nearest neighbor couplings, this is nearest neighbor, um, J i j, sigma z i, sigma z j. Okay, so 
this has Ising symmetry. <coughs> And the operator that does that is uh, rotate all spins by pi about the x-axis. If I rotate by pi, if I rotate about the x-axis, this term is unaffected. And if I rotate by pi about the x-axis, I flip both sigma z's, and so this term is unaffected. So that's a symmetry. That's the global spin flip symmetry. And again, these are non-negative numbers. There's a minus sign. So the ground state of this thing is, if this term, right, when this term is dominant over this term, the ground state of this is a fermion. <coughs> so, yeah, again, just that's sort of, just keep it simple right now. Yeah, so it's a fermion. Transverse, transverse field, Ising, fermion. <laughs> <laughs> Went from model to government. Um, okay, and so when this term dominates, the ground state has the spins along pointing along the positive x-axis, which is probably that way. Um, doesn't break the symmetry. The ground state is even under this symmetry, right? Because Pointing along the x-axis is up plus down over square root of 2. So it's even under this symmetry, but it's a unique ground state when, when uh, spins point along that direction. So when, when this term dominates. When this term dominates, there's two almost degenerate ground states, which are spins up, and the majority of spins up, or and the majority of spins down. So, so let, me, let me just emphasize that. When J's dominate, the ground state looks like up, all ups. Well, not all ups. You know, a couple might be flipped because of the transverse field. Well, a bunch of configurations like this, with the majority of spins up, plus or minus exactly <coughs> the opposite configuration. Over square root of two, so the ground states, and the splittings between them, the splitting between them goes as e to the minus some constant times l squared, because Thomas Voigt talked about that, that the, the matrix element to flip from this to this is you got to flip all the spins, so it's it's at this order in perturbation theory. So you're saying they don't break symmetry. So there are two ground states. So I'm talking now about a finite system. The exact ground states. So, so first of all, because of this symmetry, which commutes with this Hamiltonian, all the eigenstates of the finite system will be either even or odd under this symmetry operation, either positive or negative under global spin flip. Okay. So these are. Cats, Schrodinger cats, because you've got two, the exact eigenstate is a particular linear combination of two macroscopically different states. Right? And, and this is, and generally what I'll do is I'll just call this guy up in quotes. And what that means is most spins up with the quantum fluctuations you need from the transverse, you get from the transverse field. And then you have exactly the opposite thing. So when I do a global spin flip on that, I get down in quotes. Okay. So these guys are related to each other by this symmetry operation. Okay, and these have splittings. If you start out with one of those non-eigen states. If you start, if you start say, in this state, which is a linear combination of these two, it will probably oscillate between the two at this frequency. If it's an isolated system, no coupling to the environment, and of course to exponential precision, it will rob the outside. Okay, 
So now, but now let's say we have strong disorder. And let's first, okay, so if we have strong disorder, uh, let's think about doing the strong disorder renormalization group, which you've heard about from Gil. And I believe he covered the transverse realizing model, right? In two, in two dimensions? Uh, it works in two dimensions. Not as neatly. You've got to sort of do it on the computer if you want to get exponents and stuff. So remember how the strong disorder renormalization group works. You look at your Hamiltonian. You look at your Hamiltonian, and you find the strongest term, and you pick it up, and you, uh, well, the traditional thing is you put that term in its ground state, and then you perturb around that to get a renormalized Hamiltonian. But if you're not trying to do ground states, which I'm not, I want to do excited states, instead you could just put it in the excited state and do perturbation theory around that. Right? So you can, you can do strong disorder RG for excited states. And uh, Gil and David Pecker posted a paper discussing this rather explicitly recently. So, so if our strongest term is HI sigma XI, I have two choices. I can put the spin along the plus x axis, and then I'm putting it in the local ground state, or I can put it in the minus x axis, and then I'm putting it in an excited state. Right? And you do the perturbation theory around the excited state, it's mathematically almost the same as around the ground state, so the RG equations look pretty much exactly the same. Right? Okay. So choose this or that. Right? And then if it's minus Jij, sigma z i, sigma z j. Now we choose, uh, we choose, uh, well, we, either, we either choose to make these parallel or we choose to make them anti-parallel. So we choose either, we choose sigma z i times sigma z j equals plus or minus one. Right. So if I choose plus one, I'm picking the ground state. I'm putting the two spins parallel. That's the ground state. That's what Gil did. If I pick minus one, I'm saying I'm going to put a domain wall between those two spins. So here's spin i, here's spin j. I put a domain wall between them. <coughs> if I pick minus one. But again, you do the RG for the excited state, it looks the same. Okay. Actually, a quick comment. Yeah? So, I reposted the notes such that they have all four lectures, and the fourth at the, at the end is actually an explicit analysis of this in 1D using unitary transformations. Yeah. So you really analyze the entire spectrum of one. Okay, so, so you have this discussed in your notes. Okay. Yes, but it wasn't fully discussed. Yeah. The and also, the uh, last few pages of my notes are, were, I don't know if they're posted yet, but they, they've been scanned. <laughs> uh, so there will be a, a little add on to my notes as well, which will be posted. Because this, this stuff wasn't in what was posted before. Um, OK, so if, say, we're in the ferromagnetic phase, so say the J's are generally stronger than the H's, and we're in the phase where the, where the ground state should be a ferromagnet, we run the RG, we mostly get these guys here, and we choose do we put in a domain wall or not. And that's mostly what we're doing. And what we end up with is making an eigenstate, so let me just draw a picture, something like this. Put a domain wall there, and we got a domain wall <coughs> there, and we got one there. Right? So I put in three domain walls. Right? And this is my up in quotes. And now I can do the global spin flip of this, right? Which is plus or minus. Up, up, 
Domain wall is in exactly the same place, but spins opposite. Better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's probably better to draw the domain walls first. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys know what I mean here. This RG, I can generate, for example, this excited state. Um, or these two excited states. These two excited states. Because once I've integrated out, there's nothing left but one spin, which is represented by this up in quotes, with this, which implicitly means this domain wall pattern. Then the only thing left is to flip it. Right? And, we, and so you always, at the very end of the RG, when there's only one spin left, you don't have any term like this, because you've only got one spin left. So you always, on the last step of the RG, this term, this guy comes up, because it's the only term left. And so, of course, it's the strongest term left in the, in the Hamiltonian, because there's only one term. Right? And you have to choose to either make the positive or negative linear combination of And these are spin glass cats. Right. So, so what you have is a particular pattern of spins, which is not a ferromagnet. It's got a particular pattern. So it looks like the ground state of a spin glass, even though the Hamiltonian is a ferromagnet. Um, and then you've got the exact opposite. So they're macroscopically different in the sense that every spin is flipped. And, and you add those up with positive or negative, and those are that's what the eigenstates look like. So do you have this linear condition at all scales? Right? No, this is only happening at the full system. Right, so this is the whole system. This is you know, L, L by L. Right, and on the smaller scales, what I'm doing is I'm putting in domain walls. And in reality, if we're not deep in the ordered phase, you're going to have little islands here where the field came up and you didn't order them along the z direction. They've got, right? the, 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 they won't have, you know, in here they won't have a definite magnetization because the transverse field on here was strong enough to put things, so they're the linear combination. put them into, yeah, the inside of here it's a linear combination of something. Right. So yeah, right. it'll happen on different scales. But if you're in the ferromagnetic phase, this stuff will happen on small scales, and then it'll stop happening, and then it'll happen on the macro scale on the whole system. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's why I said on different scales. <coughs> shorter scales, you have these. But it's not going to be happening on all scales unless you're at the critical point. Right. Only if you're at the critical point is it happening on all scales. Yeah, what it's going to do, it's going to happen until you get past the correlation length, and then it'll, it'll look like you know, you've got no quantum fluctuations. But then you, you, know the, you know you have the symmetry, so finally you know the eigenstates have to be either even or odd under symmetry, so you have to do it at the scale of the whole system. So how does the perturbation do you come in here? Like, so it seems like the way you've described it, Data just labeled by contribution. Well, the perturbation theory tells you how you renormalize the Hamiltonian, right? So, the, so as you renormalize, the H's and the J's get renormalized. Um, and well, and the lattice mean, stops being a square lattice. It starts becoming a kind of ugly lattice with all sorts of funny connections put in. So that's this what is, This is Lessig Matrunich's thesis doing so this, this for the ground this state. What determines, uh, this renormalization is what determines how eventually, at some scale, the Islands of sigma f, eigenstates of sigma x go away because as you coarse grain. Yeah, right. If you're in the ordered phase, the H's renorm the, the renormalization equations causes the H's to become very small. Right. 
and compared to the J's. The J's don't shrink much. And in fact, the J's actually grow in two dimensions because you're adding up multiple connections, but the H's shrink. And then after that, you're always getting J's. Right? Until the very end, when you just get one H at the very end, and that makes you put, but, but that makes you either put a plus or a minus sign here. Okay, so beyond that scale, you're really in a fragmented state, and then each state is just labeled by configuration. You're in the ordered state. It's in the ordered state. Right? So we're not, in, we're not in the ground state. We're talking about any eigenstate. Right. So we're in the ordered state, and the type of order it has is spin glass order. And it's just labeled by domain wall configuration. Well, that's, yeah, that's one way of describing it. Given that the ground state is a ferromagnet, one way of describing this is a bunch of domains of the ferromagnet. And these domain walls, if your disorder is strong enough, they're localized. They're not. So in the, in the localized spin glass phase, these domain walls are localized in here. And so uh, the thing you need to localize in this phase is the domain walls. So this is sort of schematic, informal. Um, but I hope it makes a little bit of sense. OK, and so now let me draw our proposed phase diagram right here. <coughs> okay, so, so I'm going to go, so here's the energy. We're talking about eigenstates, so let's, let's work in the microcanonical ensemble and look at things with function of energy rather than temperature because if you're localized, you don't really have a temperature. Here's the ground state energy, so we'll put the ground state energy at, at the bottom here. And this is the disorder strength, the randomness. And let's say we're, the relative strengths of the H's and the J's are such that we're in the ferromagnetic phase. So the J's are generally stronger than the H's. The ground state is in the ferromagnetic phase. Um, and I'm just changing the amount of disorder, but always staying in the ferromagnetic phase. So there's, a, you know, there's another part of the phase diagram where I go through the quantum critical point out of the ferromagnetic phase into the paramagnetic ground state. But the interesting regime is when the ground state is ferromagnetic. Okay. And so here there's no disorder. It's the pure problem. And it has a two-dimensionalizing phase transition at some critical energy. Thermodynamic phase transition between the ferromagnet and the paramagnet. This is temperature as well here, but as a function of energy. And let's turn on the disorder in a way such that, such that this is more or less flat. Um, so this is the thermodynamic phase transition. <coughs> between the symmetry breaking phase transition between the paramagnet and the ferromagnet. Okay. Over here at zero disorder, this model, the, 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 the transit field transitfieldizing model in two dimensions is not integrable. It should satisfy ETH. So we've got ETH here, and we've got ETH here. And there's actually another story, which I might get to, but probably not, which is some interesting things that happen when you combine ETH with symmetry breaking. And what we're talking about now is combining many body localization with symmetry there's another, another story here, which may not get to. Um, okay. Now I turn on the disorder, we're going to go through a many body localization transition if we turn the disorder up strong enough. Right? At right above the ground state, what are the excitations? They're spin flips. They're like particles. They're in a random environment. As soon as I turn on the disorder, it's GOE, it's symmetry class, orthogonal, we're in two dimensions, all states are localized. So the transition will come in like this, but as I go up to higher temperature, you're gonna, the ETH phase is gonna survive up to some value. So, so this is the, the, uh, the localization transition. Just single body localization. No, many body localization transition. So over here, it's MBL, many body localized, many body localized. Because you're in two dimensions. So it's not free, there's no free description. 
Right. Well, it, right, it's weak. Right. This model over here is not integrable. And, and uh, the thermal phase can survive some disorder. Yeah. So that's a localization transition. This is a thermodynamic phase transition. This is an eigenstate phase transition. It's not there in the thermodynamics. So in some sense, it's there in the statistical <coughs> mechanics if you choose to do your statistical mechanics in the microcanonical ensemble in the limit where the microcanonical ensemble only includes one many body eigenstate. So this phase transition, in some weak sense, is there in statistical mechanics. But it's a, kind of a funny sense. It's, um, okay. so basically, if you look at the eigenstates, you can see the difference between this and this. If you look at but it's, a, it's an eigenstate phase transition. But this and we had thought about this back with RG. We had thought about this and looked at that. And, well, that's not very interesting, is it? <laughs> it's just two different things, and they just cross. Right? And that's sort of where we left it for a few years until we went back and thought about it some more. Um, and there's actually another, right? Of course, this thing I just described here, where is it on this phase diagram? And there's actually two phase, there's another phase transition here going kind of like this. So this is many body localized paramagnetic, many body localized spin glass, and here many body localized ferromagnetic and spin glass at the same time. <coughs> so there's another eigenstate phase transition here, which is the phase transition between, uh, so this is here, we have our spin glass cats. The eigenstates are spin glass cats. Here they're ferromagnetic cats, both here and here. Um, these have a spin glass aspect to them. Whereas up here, um, there's no long range order, it's still a paramagnetic. Right? And why do we think the paramagnetic phase always intrudes between the thermal phase and the spin glass phase. So let's say we hit this line here. So we're above the thermodynamic, well above the thermodynamic phase transition. So the spin, and this is thermal. So this is equilibrium, thermal equilibrium. So the spin-spin correlation length is some, is short. And it's short all the way to this line, right? Because it's thermal the whole way across here. The spin, <coughs> spin, spin correlations are doing nothing as I approach that line because it's just thermal, and I'm not approaching the phase trend, the thermal phase trend. Okay. But once I go into the many-body localized phase, now my spin-spin correlation function can start having longer range order than it does at equilibrium. And so now the spin-spin spin correlation length can start growing, and then it'll diverge over here. So if you assume and that's what this is based on. Assuming all these phase transitions are continuous, there's no first order phase transitions. And there are actually theorems against first order thermodynamic phase transitions in random two dimensional systems. That's Eisenman and Ware. I don't know whether they apply to these eigenstate phase transitions. That's an interesting question. Is could you have first order eigenstate phase transitions in low dimensional disordered systems, or does the something like the Eisenman Ware theorem apply, but that's an open question. Uh, but if you assume things are continuous, the paramagnetic phase must intrude all the way down to here, assuming things, things evolve continuously. Wait, you talk about correla you know, correlations? Yeah, correlations. correlations. That's my next topic. So what do I mean by correlations? Yes. And you guys probably aren't so familiar about spin glass. Has anybody talked about spin glasses in this thing? No. So those of you who don't know much about spin glasses, I'll get to tell you a little bit about that. Um, okay, so we've got this, right, and so what I love to say about this, those of you who know about spin glasses will get this joke, maybe. Um, here, every eigenstate has spin glass long range order. It's a spin glass in this phase here. Right? So, so this isn't just one spin glass. This is a spin glass 
with a different pattern for every eigenstate. So it's got many states. So I love to say, this is a spin glass Giorgio Parisi will love. Because <laughs> it has two to the n different states, pure states, which are stable. There's many states. Um, um, OK, and so the eigenstates look like this, plus or minus. over square root 2. And this up represents any pattern of domain walls you can put in. And this is exactly the same pattern of domain walls, just with all the spins flipped. Right? So those, that's what the eigenstates look like over here. Okay? And they're either even or odd under the global spin flip. Okay? So let's look in one of these eigenstates at the spin correlations. Okay? So if we look at sigma zi in one of these eigenstates, it's zero. Well, that's not Friday, but, um, is because every spin is equally likely to be up or down. So it's symmetric. Right? But if we look at sigma zi, sigma zj average, this is not zero, even for large Rij. So in whatever particular pattern I have of domain walls, this eigenstate has a definite pattern of domain walls. So if I tell you this spin here is up, it tells you I'm either in this block or this block. right? And it tells you what all the other spins are doing. So there's spin, there's long range or there's long range spin spin correlations in a specific pattern peculiar to that eigenstate. So these guys, I said not equal to zero, but they're you know they're half of them are positive and half of them are negative, and that's what the spin correlation looks like in a spin glass phase. Right? The spins are correlated, but in a pattern that's specific to that particular state. In, in usual spin glasses, the pattern is specific to that particular sample. But here, it's not only particular to that particular sample, meaning that particular Hamiltonian, but it's also particular to that particular eigenstate, okay? which, which is an ingredient you don't have when you have spin glass order at equilibrium. Right? And so in order to see the long range order, one thing to do is just look. You know, look and see if these are not zero, but what is often done is to do sigma zi, sigma zj, average within an eigenstate, square, and then average over eigenstates, and also maybe over different Hamiltonians as well. And then this shows long range order. And it shows long range order at infinite temperature. You have a symmetry breaking phase transition that happens within the many body localized phase at arbitrarily high temperature if you have strong enough disorder. It happens in one dimension. So it's a quantum phase transition happening at high temperatures in one dimension. Um, so that shows that these phase transitions don't obey some of the theorems because there are theorems by Piles and Landau saying there's no phase transitions in one dimension, but they're based, those theorems are based on assuming equilibrium statistical mechanics applies, which it doesn't here. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on here. Um, question. Yeah. The spin glass and the ferromagnet respond differently to uh, small external symmetry breaking. Not enormously differently. The ferromagnet has a moment proportional to the number of spins, whereas the typical spin glass eigenstate has a magnetic moment proportional to the square root of the number of spins. So they will both, this degenerate near degeneracy between these two states and the, the business of just being plus or minus, they will, they will both quickly you know, polarize in a field, or their energy levels will split quickly. Right? So there's, there's a quantitative difference, but it's not an enormous difference. Right? So that's actually one of the interesting things here, that you know, if you could prepare these states up here, 
even at very high temperatures, they're enormously sensitive to an applied field. And so we sort of wonder, oh, you know, could you make a really sensitive magnetometer out of this guy? But I guess I don't understand this state that you're calling up and close. Does that actually have a net magnetization? This by central, you know, it, it, it's got, oh, okay, I see. it's got fluctuate, you know, the chances of the magnetization being zero is very small. Right, there's a very small set of states where the mag total magnetization is near zero. Typically, it's of order the square root of the number of spins, right, which is a large number. Right, if you're talking about coupling a field to it and lifting the degeneracy between these two, it's a big moment. Yeah. So as we go higher up in energy, uh, won't the fluctuations of the domain walls make that um, second uh, correlation function zero? Large yes. Distances. As you approach this phase boundary, uh -huh. these correlations at long distance go to zero. I see. So, so the, the domain walls will delocalize as you go here. And there's a phase transition here. And as, as far as we understand, this phase transition here in the excited states, in the Ising model, should be in the same universality class as for the ground state. That, that Gil talked about. The RG is neglecting an important process. For example, you know, there might be, you know, basically when, when you run the RG, you, know, you, you choose one or the other, and then you put it in it, and you say it stays in it for the rest of the RG. But what could happen, okay, so you do this on one energy, and then you go down in energy, you know, when you make a choice down here, and then you make a choice down here, going down in energy, but these two energies might add up to exactly this energy, and then you have a resonance where you could flip these two and flip this one, and it's all on shell. So there's a, there's a, a bunch of resonances which are being neglected in the RG. They're not a concern for the ground state, because if everything's in the ground state, you, you can't flip things and have the total energy add up to zero, right? But if some things are excited and other things are in the ground state, you, you put things from the excited state down to their ground state and the ground state up to their excited state and those energies can add up to zero and open up new processes. And that's what, you know, once those things proliferate, you lose your localization. You know, the RG breaks down, you lose your localization. And this trans, so, 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 the, so the strong disorder RG looks like it can deal with these kinds of phase transitions, which are phase transitions within the many body localized phase. In some sense, the many body localized phase, even at high energies, it's like a ground state. It's only got area law entanglement, right? And so it's, it's a lot like a ground state. But this one here, this transition here, uh, you know, we're trying to develop some sort of strong disorder RG for it, but it, Certainly not straightforward, and perhaps impossible. <laughs> but uh, we're not, we haven't given up. That's uh, worked with Ehud Altman and his student, Ronan Vosk, who have also done very nice work on the many-body localization problem. I don't think I mentioned their names yet in my lecture, but there's a couple of nice papers by, uh, by them. In fact, I think they have a paper about the Ising model, right? They, they recently posted a paper about the Ising model. Last week. Just last week. <laughs> Back to back to oh, right, which I did mention. Okay, so yes. that wasn't, that wasn't, that wasn't fair, but you were here. Yeah. Sorry, so I'm just, I'm thinking about the central phase at the top of your diagram. This, 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 guy. Localized paramagnet. Yeah. this guy here. So in this phase, all the domain walls are delocalized. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, the, 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 we're in, we're in a, I'm assuming JIJ is strong enough that in the ground state, it would be a ferromagnet. But what happens is because of these resonant processes that I was just mentioning, the transition between the ferromagnet and the paramagnet, the, the higher you go in energy, the more these resonances you have, right? Because you need a, something in its excited state to flip down and transfer the energy. So the higher you go up here, the more and more resonances you have. And that's why all the phase boundaries slope this way. All the ones involving localization slope this way, right? And so this bound, this, sorry. Yeah, this boundary here 
If you follow it over here, so there's another axis here, which is changing the strengths of the H's and the J's, and we go through the quantum phase transition out this way. So this boundary comes around and goes down onto the quantum critical point between the ferromagnet and the paramagnet. But as you go up in energy, the paramagnets favored, you know, the resonance effects mess up the order because they open up new fluctuations and it favors the paramagnet and the ferromagnet shrinks. But do you still have the concept of a spatial localization? Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, oh right. There was another thing I was going to say. So in this phase here, so here, the L bits, so casually speaking, in this phase, the L bits are the first approximation, the sigma x's. Whereas in this phase here, the L bits are, in quotes, the sigma z's. Right. I see. So it's the sigma x's that get localized rather than the Yeah. So we still have localized modes, oh, okay. but the modes don't have this structure of, of you know, having order in z. That's very casual. That's why I put quotes on the R. <laughs> this is true depending upon what the meaning of R is, <laughs> to quote someone. Um, yeah? Uh, I have a basic confusion about this phase diagram. That is, if we are talking about uh, um, eigenstate uh, um, phase transition, I understand that the vertical axis is the energy of that eigenstate. Yeah. But I do not understand how you can draw a thermodynamic phase transition on the same axis. Well, the thermodynamic phase transition happens at a certain energy. Right. In thermodynamics, the energy is a function of the temperature. You're comfortable with, it, with the phase transitioning happening at a particular temperature. So just think of you know, T, Tc, 0. You know, e is a monotonic function of T, so I could just reparameterize. Yeah, but what I'm plotting then is a average property of uh, eigenstate, right? Average in the, with the Boltzmann factor. Well, that's not what I mean. Okay. Let's not. I'm working in the microcanonical ensemble. Right. So this is the average property of the eigenstates in the microcanonical ensemble. And, and at, at this transition here, it's not that every eigenstate is ferromagnetic here and every eigenstate is not ferromagnetic just above the line. It's that the, you know, the maximum entropy, you know, the, if I sample the eigenstates from this energy, all but a set of measure zero will be ferromagnets. And if I sample them at this energy, all it says a set of measure zero will not be ferromagnets. I can make a ferromagnetic eigenstate, which is a very rare configuration of domain walls, at energies above here as well. So, 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 you know, there's there's a bunch of subtleties here. Um, <coughs> that's true for this boundary. The, this boundary won't depend. You know, this boundary, all ETH, it's about all the eigenstates. So this boundary won't depend on specific eigenstates. This boundary will. I will be able to find rare eigenstates that buy up, that don't aren't obeying this phase boundary. It's just the you know the vast majority of them in the thermodynamic limit, almost all of them will do this. This boundary, not sure. I suspect. Yeah, probably it's true about this boundary as well. But that, that's, uh, but these are these are details. Yeah. And is it clear that all those lines go to one single line, a single point? All five lines cross the same. It, it, it's based on there's an argument for it, which is if if they're all continuous phase transitions, I think it has to happen. The only way for it to not happen, I think you have to have first order phase transitions, I think. But this is certainly not clear. Um, let me just say one word about this phase here. 
when you have <coughs> symmetry breaking in ETH. Um, well, not one word, a couple sentences. <laughs> so let's, here is the magnetization. Here is the free energy. Now, we're, now we have ETH, so we can talk in thermodynamic terms. And here's the barrier between the, the up state and the down state. Right? But we're not, so the ground state is down here. It's a linear combination of the two guys at the very bottom of this well here. But let's look at, look at some state up here. So we're not, we're not at the ground state, but we're up, you know, up somewhere here. So it looks kind of like this. And we have a linear combination of this down and this. So some thermal state that's magnetized down over here and the exact opposite thermal state that's magnetized up over here. And we make a linear combination of those. That's what the eigenstates look like. And you might ask, oh, how does it tunnel? And the way it tunnels how does a quantum tunnel, as an isolated quantum system doing <coughs> unitary time evolution, how does it tunnel? It does it by thermal activation. Because the system itself is a heat bath, and what it does, without changing the energy, you notice I put free energy on this axis, not energy, it tunnels at constant energy by finding a rare state when you can go up here by paying a lot of entropy costs, that gets you over the barrier. And what that state looks like, so, so say you have up, and you're going to tunnel to down, what you do is you make a domain wall up, down, sweep it across the system, up, down, and take it out. And you pay for this, you pay the energy for this domain wall from borrowing it from the bulk of the domains. Because within the bulk of the domains, you have thermal fluctuations, a lot of flip spins, not enough to destroy the magnetization, but you've got some energy proportional to the area that you can borrow from, and you only have to pay proportional to the length. So in any finite dimensional system, you tunnel from, at non-zero temperature, you tunnel by thermal activation which is kind of interesting. The distinction between quantum tunneling and thermal activation, sort of, when you talk about large quantum systems isolated from the environment, it's sort of, the, the distinction sort of goes away. Um, so that's, that's one thing I want to mention. And then the last point, if instead of doing a d-dimensional ferromagnet, you do an infinite dimensional ferromagnet, then the barrier is extensive and the reservoir is extensive, and you can get into a situation where the reservoir, where you break the bank if you want to act thermally activate, and so the system actually tunnels. And so you actually have a phase diagram. So this is now for an infinite range transverse fetalizing model. You got the paramagnet, you got thermal cats. This is all ferromagnet.